Greetings and welcome to this virtual session. We are coming to you as uh, from the Disability Networking Zone as part of the Global Village at the 23rd International AIDS Conference. We welcome you to this presentation, Wellness Importance Within the Context of Health Screening and Testing. I'm joined by some of our team who will, I will introduce to you later. I'm Vernon Openshaw, the Project Manager, and I welcome you and remind you that there is additional material available. You will see further details um, on, on the screen as we continue. We are part of the Disability Networking Zone, and the presentation is entitled Wellness Importance Within the Context of Health Screening and Testing, and it's brought to you by Afrique Rehabilitation and Research Consultants. We're a nonprofit company operating um, within the southern part of Africa. Just a little bit about the program. Since July 2018, uh, ARC, I'm going to refer to it as ARC instead of the whole big thing, Afrique Rehabilitation and Research Consultants, was appointed by the South African National AIDS Council in partnership with our National Deve Department of Social Development to implement the department's social and behavior change program targeting people with disability. This program was rolled out initially in three of our nine provinces, and we then added a fourth province, the Northwest province. We're going to play you a short video. It's a compilation of various um, events where people with disability participated in some kind of physical activity. The name of my disability is scoliosis. I was not born like the face. It just happened during uh, 2011. When I came here at Khalexpane, I saw, I thought I was the only one in the world. But when I came here, I saw people with disability, then I felt proud. I just feel happy. My name is T. 
I'm from Bryce Rustenberg and I'm 17 years old. And when I grew up, I just wanted to, to be a pilot, but I couldn't do it because of the subject at school. So I decided to become a doctor. As a youth, you need to know your status. I know my status, so you need to get tested. Thank you, Jackie. The aim and objective uh, of, of this project initially was to decrease risky sexual behavior among people with physical disability to reduce the incidence of HIV. But later on, as we engaged with the participants in the early stages, we in, extended the aim to include sexual health disability rights wellness, communicable and non-communicable diseases, and sexual abuse and violence. This came out of the experience that participants shared with our facilitators. And so our workshops incorporated additional topics such as sexual and reproductive health and rights, STI, sexually transmitted infections, healthy lifestyles and behaviors, non-communicable diseases, tuberculosis, and more recently, COVID-19. So you may want to say, well, why wellness? Um, why did we increase, as it were, the scope of this uh, project? Well, we realized that we're not just talking with an individual who has a disease, as people with disabilities so often are seen. We're talking to a complete human being. And so we were wanting to speak to wellness, to the whole way in which people live their lives. And so wellness is not just the final goal and end to be accomplished, but rather it becomes a lifestyle that we adopt. It is an intentional adoption of a lifestyle. And wellness is more than being free from illness. It is the process encompassing growth and change that lasts a lifetime. Maintaining an optimal level of wellness is essential to living a healthier life, whether you are a person using a wheelchair or you have a visual impairment. It is a part of your life, your living. And as such, it is essential to cultivate a culture of wellness within communities so that communities can have the tools to grow and change their lifestyles to those more conducive to good health. The workshops provided a platform through which participants had the opportunity to get tested and go for screening. We believed it was important for participants to know their status which would allow them to take better care of their health and those of their partners, their household and community. Knowing their status also would enable them to change their unsafe sexual behaviors to those that are more conducive to their and their community's health. And so screening and testing provided participants with the opportunity to get much needed information and help from healthcare workers, as well as aiding with referrals. The workshops additionally offered an avenue whereby important topics could be discussed and important questions asked. It was important for our facilitators to create that safe space where people were free to engage and ask one of our rules of engagement is, there is no such question as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one you don't ask. And so we encourage people to explore and to discover new things about their sexuality, about their, their being, their wellness. And this allowed participants to gain relevant information and subsequently increase their knowledge and understanding on the issues of HIV and AIDS, sexual and reproductive health, 
healthy lifestyles, TB, and non-communicable diseases. By active participation and providing a safe space for clear communication, participants had a better understanding of these topics, their health and well-being, as well as improving their skills in correct male and female condom use for safer sex. It is noteworthy that many of the workshops were conducted in rural or semi-rural areas, where the workshop was the first time most of the participants had access to sexual and reproductive health and rights information. In addition, many of the participants in the workshops were youth, and this was their first opportunity to openly discuss sexual issues, something they were unable to do in their communities and very often they were the victims of myths and, and, and wrong information that was being communicated. I may also add at this stage that all our facil facilitators have a disability. And so people find it far easier to relate to somebody like them. I'm going to hand over to Jacqueline now. She is our project coordinator. And we have, uh, at each and every one of the workshops, we've had a pre and a post um, workshop evaluation. This firstly provides us with a great deal of information about the participants, but it also enables us to adjust the program wherever we find that people uh, did not find something particularly interesting or they, they, we were lacking in some of the information that they needed. And so this is the, um, the results of this, uh, the, from the first phase of our um, three phases that we have completed to date. We have not had the opportunity yet to com complete the analysis of, of the other the data. Over to you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Vernon. So just looking at the data from our first three phases, phase one, our target was to meet 1,575 participants, of which we achieved 1,649. Phase two, our target was 396, we achieved 416, and in phase three, our target was 792, of which we achieved 1,017. As Vernon mentioned, majority of the statistics I'm going to go over now largely came from phase one. So looking at the socio-demographic data, there was a fairly even distribution of males and females, although 2.6% of the participants opted not to disclose their gender. There was a wide range of disabilities, most of which were physical at 45.1%. Other disabilities also included visual impairments, hearing impairments, and intellectual disabilities. More than one tenth, so 13.6%, had no disability, while 20% chose not to disclose whether or not they did have a disability. Looking at level of education, 31.9% had either no or primary school level of education. 41% had some high school education. 18.5% completed high school and 0.3% had tertiary education. Looking at sexual partner data, a large percentage of our data is missing, largely due to the fact that participants opted not to disclose such information. However, what we could compile was that most participants indicated having a sexual partner at 62.2%, as compared to those that did not at 37.8%. Although 20.1% indicated having more than one partner, 79.9% indicated only having one partner. There was almost equal percentages that indicated being sexually active compared to those not being sexually active. Looking at risk, 51.5% considered themselves at increased risk of HIV and AIDS while 48.5% did, did say that they didn't think they had an increased risk. 
54.6% indicated that they do use condoms, while 45.4% indicated no condom use. A small percentage, 20.6%, indicated that they are not considering using condoms in the future, while 79.4% said that they would consider it. Overall, majority did believe that condoms protect them from HIV and AIDS, sexually transmitted infections, and pregnancy. Looking at the awareness, majority had heard about HIV and AIDS at 81.6% and sexually transmitted diseases at 71.8%. 73.3% of participants indicated that there is no cure for AIDS, while 26.7% indicated that there is. Almost equal numbers indicated having taken an HIV test at 52.7%, compared to those who had not taken an HIV test at 47.3%. Majority, so 83.8%, also said they knew where they could be tested for HIV. 57.4% said they had not taken a TB test, compared to those, 42.6%, who said that they had taken a tuberculosis test. 54.5% had also stated that they had not been tested for diabetes and hypertension at 46.7%, as compared to those, 45.4%, who had been tested for diabetes and 53.3% for hypertension. A large percentage, 45.7%, sorry, thought that a healthy looking person cannot be HIV positive. Only 23.6% knew what PET, post-exposure prophylaxis, meant, and 18.7% what PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, meant. Looking at health risk behaviors, 42.1% indicated using tobacco, 39% using alcohol, 33.3% having an unhealthy diet, and 22.1% being physically inactive. 70% of our participants, however, did indicate that they exercise regularly. Looking at health services, 92% said that they make use of their local community health center. However, 11.1% said that they do not feel that they are understood at their local community health centers. 36.7%, however, did say that they feel confident in their local community health center. Thank you very much. Vernon, back to you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Just want to emphasize that firstly, those that data came from the pre-evaluation um, uh, of the workshop participants. And so hopefully um, the post-evaluation would show that a large, uh, a much larger percentage of people um, realized that there was no cure for, for AIDS as, as an example. Uh, also, just to point out that initially we were due to work mainly with people with physical disability. But, you know, when you, when you go to a village and you're, it, it gets known that there is a workshop, people flock because there is just so little of this, um, of people coming to bring information to you. And so, and I, and I do want to pay tribute to our facilitators because each and every one of them had to be thrown in at the deep end and suddenly find that here is a person who has a visual disability here is another person who has a hearing uh, disability and that every single person was was included there no one was left out um, and then also to say the the how important it was for us to for people physically to be able to put their hands on a female condom. And I think our f facilitators would agree that virtually uh, 50, 60, maybe even 70 or 80 percent of our participants had never ever heard of a female condom, uh, condom let alone ever touched one. And so the, the practical use of male and female condoms was incredibly important as well as offering them for distribution. People were able to take away with them male and female condoms. 
I'd like to introduce, uh, that is our team. You will see on the bottom left of your screen, Susanna Spires, who's with us. Um, I'll give her an opportunity to speak in a moment. And then we have Dan Kakani, who unfortunately, um, his area is experiencing some power outage problems at the moment. He's unable to join us. We have Mandla uh, Nkota from the Eastern Cape. We will introduce, he will speak in a moment. Sherwin Gerville, who's our second facilitator down here in the, in the Western Cape. And then unfortunately, Peo Makota um, from My King is having a similar issue that they're doing maintenance on their, their power um, infrastructure today and she's unable to join us. And we also are joined by our technical advisor, uh, Dr. Jacques Lloyd. Let's just move over, Jacqueline, to give Susanna an opportunity to share with us some of the highlights from, from her point of view, as well as some of the challenges and uh, the way that she thinks we may be able to take this forward. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Vernon. Yes, Vernon, for me, it was a privilege, especially when I can go to the rural areas, which is a lot around uh, the Oton district. And for me, it was um, the people, it was the first time for them to see female condoms and uh, not to mention to touch it and especially the young ones. And uh, the fact that they don't really know about STIs. It was, for them, it was an eye opener because they just know about the infection, but they don't understand the risk around uh, STIs also. And the TB is also high in the district. Uh, and they were so pleased to have all the information that we could give them. And then what we can do uh, in future, they really ask about, uh, isn't there a follow up or isn't there more information we can give them um, because they are so hungry for information and they really, really need to get some more information, not just around that, uh, this is what we are giving them at the moment, but even if there's another programs or things, that we can roll out to them, they will be, for them, it will be a wow just to get the information and then to just give it to their, uh, their families and friends and in their communities that, to distribute them. Although we give them the pamphlets, uh, the pamphlets is all in English and uh, in the rural, mostly they speak Afrikaans. So for them, it's a bit of a challenge with the English uh, to, so if we can maybe translate some of the pamphlets to Africans just to give them to them so they can understand. Uh, they see the pictures, but they don't really understand what's going inside the uh, pamphlets. Thank you, Vernon. Thanks, Susanna. And now, Mondla Mkedisi Nkota from the Eastern Cape. Welcome, my hometown, East London. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vernon. Um, uh, from the Eastern Cape, um, I would like really to take this opportunity really to acknowledge and thank this opportunity that we have given by ACK. Um, like Susanna was saying that, um, you know, when you go to these areas um, doing this facilitation, you sometimes see people very, very happy in terms of getting this information because some of them, you know, it's new to them. They've never, you know, uh, be in a situation where they are in a workshop where they would be given an opportunity to engage on issues, on their wellness issues and also express themselves around the challenges they are facing, that are facing in the rural areas. Because, I mean, as you know, that Eastern Cape is more rural. And then the fact that we were, be, we were trying to make sure that we go deeper, deeper into rural areas, where there is no, you know, um, formal resources, you know, in terms of, you know, even the clinics are not nearer to the people. Uh, some of them, it's very difficult for them to get into those clinics. And, um, you know, um, also in the regards to the issue of um, 
uh, the, 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 the condoms, you know, um, I, I, I really want to say that with regards to female condoms, you know, I think 70% uh, of the people have never seen, they've never seen the female, female condom. It was the first time for them to see the female condoms. Um, and also to get an opportunity to take them home, you know. And sometimes it's surprising that you'll find that even the, 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 the health workers that sometimes we invite, you know, to our workshops because what we have done, we're inviting um, health workers as well to be part of our workshops and, and, and people from social development. Uh, you'll be surprised that, you know, even sometimes in, that, in, that, in those areas, we don't, uh, even as a, a health worker does not even know how to use a, a female condom because we sometimes give them an opportunity to demonstrate, to show the, uh, uh, our, um, you know, disabled people as to how these, uh, you know, um, uh, female condoms are, 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 are used, you know. So some of them, you know, be surprised that they don't know, you know, and that sometimes we even um, uh, try and ex explain to them as well as health workers. So it shows you that there's a, there's a lot of gaps, you know, in terms of the, the, the understanding of the, 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 these programs. Um, also, with regards to the pamphlet, you know, uh, what I've also uh, realized uh, that, you know, the clinics does not have the pamphlets that we have that speaks to disability. You know, some of them, they would want us to live with them uh, in the clinics because they want to also distribute to other people with disabilities because it's the first time I'm talking about them, the, 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 clin the clinics, the health workers, you know. So it's very, very, very important that, you know, if we're going, going forward, we need to distribute more um, pamphlets. Um, I, I also, you know, agree with uh, Susanna with regards to uh, the language that we are using because it's more like she said, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't um, um, uh, waste time to say what she was saying, but it's very important that in other areas, you know, we need to also make sure that um, we give people, um, we get, um, you know, um, uh, pamphlets that speaks to directly to people, to their languages. Um, uh, generally, or generally that, you know, this workshop are really, really working. I had one of the, you know, um, uh, community workers, I think these community developed workers, and then also an official from, um, from municipality saying that one of the, in our, one of our, um, workshops, you know, um, she, she was really, really surprised that, um, you know, to see so many disabled people attending because they usually, you know, organize workshops and inviting people with disabilities, but people with disabilities don't at attend. And it also, um, you know, like, um, uh, I agree with what Venon is saying, that sometimes it's very easy when people with disabilities themselves, when they organize these things, because people with disabilities, it's easy for them you know, to, um, to, 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 to understand people with disabilities when they are raising, when they are facilitating these workshops. Uh, I think from my side, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Mondla. Thank you. Just, uh, just a, a quick comment on languages. We have 11 official languages in South Africa, uh, plus sign language. And it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, I think, virtually every NPO um, faces is, is the, the budgetary constraints of producing pamphlets in, in 11 plus languages. But yes, that's no excuse. We, we need to do it and it's, the point is taken. Thank you. Sherwin, my neighbor Hi, here good day, everybody. the Metro. <laughs> <laughs> good day everybody once again. Um, I, I'm Sherwin Hervo one of the, the facilitators in the Western Cape, and I have a disability myself, I'm a people of paraplegic. And um, what's been good about this, uh, the, the HIV and uh, health and wellness uh, program for this, since 2019 that we've been busy with it now, it's that um, a lot of people came out to, 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 to attend these workshops that, that we were hosting. And uh, arranging these workshops uh, all came down to knowing the people in the area for, 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 for me personally. Because over the years, we, we've built relationships with the people in, in these various communities uh, across the, the Western Cape and across the, the other provinces, Eastern Cape, Houghton, and so forth. You know, so, so, so there was a baseline, or there was a contact person that you can contact to find out then if there's any interest from their side. And 
as always, they they're hungry for the information. They're excited. They want us to come out be and then and then have these workshops. So so, so that worked well. And um, other than that, um, thank you to the partners that we've been working with that, 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 that came out to do the, 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 the screening, um, HIV testing and screening for, for, for TV and so forth. Um, there's, there's various NGOs doing uh, that work in the provinces across South Africa. Um, yeah. And then um, there's always hiccups when, when, when you have a, a workshop, you know, but um, we 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 we, we, we that, that, they find them quickly and then we, we sort it out <laughs> as, as with any other thing. Yeah. And um, what I can say in, in, in future, what we should do, we should, we should continue with the work that we are doing because it, it's, it's clear that there, there, there is a big need for it uh, across the country and that people are wanting to participate in, in the workshops because they, they, they want more information, they want to be educated on, on, on their own personal uh, sexual health and reproductive health. And so that they can share it with, with other people in the communities with disabilities that we haven't even uh, reached yet. So for the next time around, we'll, we will have more people that are going to reach with, 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 the, um, with the program or, or any other program that, that comes up after this one, just to, to, to keep on, on going with, with the work that we are doing uh, in the disability sector to cover all these various um, areas. That, that, that needs to be uh, um, advocated for and, and, and people that need to be empowered with, with disabilities. Yeah. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, Joe, and thank you. And uh, we are very, very privileged to have um, as part of our team, uh, our technical expert, uh, Dr. Jacques Lloyd, and I will hand over to him for his uh, sharing of his comments with us. Uh, thank you, Vernon. Um, thank you, Jackie and the team. Uh, guys, it is always um, very uh, um, in amazing actually to hear what you guys are doing in the field and uh, the, the accomplishments that you have and, and the success stories. Um, I just want to highlight uh, one or two, one or two things uh, when it comes to to the program. I think we we should never underestimate what these guys are faced with in the communities, um, uh, and they are. Uh, we call this a wellness program because they they address the physical uh, issues that people have. They look at the occupational situations. They help people. Um, with uh, uh, um, accessing uh, services to work. Um, they, they also address environmental factors where it comes to challenges that people have in the communities. All those questions and, 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 and um, challenges come out and, and our facilitators address that, you know, when it comes to social issues, um, intellectual issues, emotional challenges that these people experience. Uh, within their uh, uh, sexual and, and, and uh, 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 encounters in the, in the communities. Uh, we're sitting with a huge number of uh, women being abused, but also men being physically abused because of their uh, disability. And um, our uh, facilitators are challenged with all of those, of those issues. And uh, they... they um, refer the the uh, communication that they that they that they get and also the the uh, complaints and uh, issues that they handle to the right people um so i think the role that they are playing is a is a is a much bigger role than just educating people with regards to hiv um i also want to just highlight a few challenges that that they are experiencing that were not highlighted here and that is the, the the challenge of re reaching the hard to reach people in the rural areas. Um, South Africa is a very wide, a, a very big country, and we are faced with a lot of transport issues and a lot of uh, issues when it comes to um, people with disabilities being able to to uh, go from one place to another to attend um, meetings and. For them to set this up is is a huge challenge, and I think 
uh, with the limited budget that has been made available for this program, the su success is very much underrated. Um, uh, yeah. uh, there is also the challenge when it comes to, 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 to food provision and providing uh, the people with disabilities with substance um, when they come to the, to, the, to the meetings. A lot of these people uh, sometimes only come for the meal because it might be the only meal that they will get for the day. And um, uh, that is a challenge. Uh, so we have to provide for that. And uh, again, I think that we uh, 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 need to look at the revision of uh, the funds allocated towards the program. Uh, I also feel that we need, um, there is a big, big need for uh, more um, collaboration with under dis other disabled people's organizations to look at the empowerment of those organizations um, uh, and our facilitators are able to do that. And um, uh, a huge shortfall is the fact that our programs, although it is focused on, on, on vulnerable population um, of people with disabilities, are not funded by uh, the primary recipients of funds that are coming from uh, PEPFAR and from the Global Fund and, and those big funders, uh, UNAIDS. I think these um, uh, in, uh, funding institutions needs to, to look at the success of these type of programs and um, uh, have a change of focus when it comes to uh, who they fund and, and how they fund programs. Um, I think also that uh, this must make, must make part of the way forward and um, using what, the success that uh, the people have um, uh, had with the program to uh, canvas for this. I uh, just want to end off with congratulating the facilitators again, because I believe that the success of this program is because of the peer-to-peer -peer communication and the fact that they, as people with disabilities, put themselves in a situation um, uh, which is not always easy, traveling for dis long distances, spending time away from home, uh, time in difficult areas. Um, I really want to congratulate you and congratulations on the success of this program to the whole team. Thank you, Jacques. And, and, and thank you for, for particularly for that, uh, that last, uh, last remark, because I think, uh, I think it was during phase two that um, the, the whole country was experiencing rolling blackouts. And you, you know, <laughs> it's difficult, you, you arrange a workshop and then you get there and you find that for four to six hours, there is no electricity. Um, and so your PowerPoint presentation <laughs> just goes out the window and you've got you know, 20, 30, 40 people sitting there um, ready to hang on every word, you know. And, and uh, really, I, the, the, this, this, one of the focuses of uh, Afrique Rehabilitation and Research uh, Consultants has been and continues to be the training and the support of peer supporters. Um, we believe it is probably the only way it, in which we can really make community-based rehabilitation a reality. It is when local people take responsibility for caring and, and, and sharing and teaching one another, learning from one another, that um, we, we can have the success. And I think we've also heard it, I, I think it was Sherwin who, who mentioned that health workers and the people from the department, the officials from the Department of Social Development, they never get an opportunity to really go out there and meet people on the ground. Um, and so they live in their little, um, I don't know what, I, what to call them, <laughs> their little cocoons, and they make decisions and, 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 and policies regarding people whom they've never met, 
Uh, and this has, I think, the, those are the two things. One is the, to re-emphasize the, the peer support aspect. And secondly, the ability to challenge officials um, as in, in the way in which they treat and view people with disability. Well, friends, I trust you've enjoyed your time with us um, today and that when we do have the opportunity to go live um, later during the, 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 the conference, you will join us for a question and answer session. The contact details are there. We have a website, we have a Facebook page. Please visit the, the website and, and like us on Facebook. You have the contact details for myself and for uh, one of our directors, Dr. Jacques Lloyd. We wish you well during this challenging time in, in the history of our world, and we commend you for the work that you continue to do in supporting people with disability and in, in, in enabling them to become part of our communities. Thank you and be well.